the inside story on the issues that affect you and your community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. People feel dangerous to walk on the street. People are afraid to come to synagogues, They're afraid to send their kids to Jewish school. In the aftermath of the deadly terror attacks in early January in the French satirical publication Charlie Hebdo, and then two days later at the Jewish kosher market in Paris, Western Europe and the entire world had to once again face the brutality of 21st century terrorism. But for the French Jewry, Jewish community still living in the aftermath of the Holocaust, these events are especially unnerving. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. I'm Dan Hurley. In the aftermath of the attacks like these, the question that goes through many people's minds is, what can I do? American Jews wanted to show their support for the French Jewish community and to learn whatever is possible from the social and political dynamics of the French society that might have implications in the United States. I am joined now by Shep Englander, the CEO of the Jewish Federation of Cincinnati, and Ethan Katz, an assistant professor uh, of history at the University of Cincinnati. Professor Katz is the author of Burdens of Brotherhood, Jews and Muslims from North Africa to France. And Shep just returned from a trip uh, with 45 people, uh, who, American Jews, who went to France to show support and to learn. First off, welcome back. Thank you. And Ethan, welcome to Newsmakers. Thank you. And this group of 45, is that how many ended up going? I know that was the intention originally. Is that we, a, Yes, we, we probably had a few more than that. There were 18 cities represented. 18 cities. Obviously put together very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, sort of Jewish federations from all over the United States. Was there are community the leaders from federations at every different size city from you know, Chicago to, Mo to Milwaukee to some uh, small Western mass cities, uh, so all over. Portland, Oregon, yeah. And what was, in your mind, your personal, what was your goal in going on this trip? Well, really two goals. One was to help a uh, community in shock to grieve, and the other one was, uh, as you said, to see what is really underneath these attacks that we can understand and learn and bring back uh, to our community. Ethan, the French Jewish community mm -hmm. is not small and insignificant. No. Uh, it is, how would you describe French Jewry at, in the 21st century? Well, it's still the second largest community in the diaspora, right? The second largest community outside of Israel. Uh, the largest being the United States? The largest State. being the United States, correct. Okay. Uh, and, you know, still talking about between half a million and 600,000 people, uh, about 70% of them are either from North Africa or of North African descent. Uh, hmm. That's a product of the very large migrations of Jews to France in the middle of the 20th century that took place while France was leaving its colonies in North Africa and shortly thereafter. Uh, so, uh, and it's a very vibrant community in many ways, right? The, one of the sort of uh, indexes for that that I often give is that outside of Israel, the city with the most kosher restaurants in the world is Paris with approximately 190. So we're talking about a community that uh, is facing challenges, as we'll talk more about, but uh, very strong and vibrant in many ways. Chef, what did you find? How, how, what was the mood of the people that you, I know, I know you met with a lot of different people, but specifically the Jewish leaders that you met with, what, what was their mood? They're really in shock. Uh, and, and it hasn't gotten better in the past month. That's what probably surprised me the most, was that it's been almost a month and you'd think that uh, the country and the Jewish community would move on. Um, this is the newspaper from just two days ago um, in the whole just, section. Just to be clear, we're taping on Friday morning. This is going to air on Sunday. So this is Wednesdays? Wednesdays. Um, is that w that's when you left to exactly. return home, right? Yeah, they gave me this newspaper uh, at, at the airport on my way home and the whole section uh, says uh, France is 9-11. So they're still just trying to unpack what this means for them. And for the Jewish community, this means do we have a future here? And they very much desperately want to have a future here, but this has shaken them more deeply than anything in their experience. One of the interesting things about the reactions is the re reactions of the official leadership of the Prime Minister of, mm -hmm. of, of France yes. and expressions of what they think the role and the future mm -hmm. of the Jewish community yeah. is. Ethan, what? 
Should you sort of summarize that, and also, what do you, how do you see that as a scholar who studied? Right. Um, no, that's a great question. I mean, the statement that, that has been quoted the most was from Prime Minister Manuel Valls standing in front of the Hypercacher the next day saying France without Jews is not France, right? And this was a statement, for one thing, of a lot of solidarity with the Jewish community, obviously. But I think it was also an expression of something much deeper. He's actually said that before. He said that during the uh, riots last summer, uh, and he expressed it at greater length then, and he's actually of Spanish descent, and he said, look, if all of the Spaniards left France, it wouldn't be the same thing as all the Jews leaving, because France is the country that emancipated its Jews during the French Revolution, that for where Jews have been kind of a signal of the way that France is a liberal beacon to the world for democracy and tolerance. And that France that we know and that we love is a place that has to be welcoming for Jews. And if it's not, then we have really fundamental problems. And, and that actually is not altogether new. That is, Jews have had both, you know, a real life and symbolic roles in the French national imagination for a long time. Not only the imagination, but also the politics. Yes. I mean, that's it, what I mean when I say yes. Yeah, yes, I mean, it, 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 this is not just lip service. Correct. Jews have been integral to Correct. all aspects of, of French life yes. and, and on that consciousness level about the, French, the meaning of the French Revolution. Right. And those of us who are American and the American Revolution, there's really important lessons to be learned here. In fact, let's get to a little of that. Shep, what did you bring home? What did you... What did you say? Did you have moments of insight, ahas, that you said, oh, wait a minute, this rings true, this, rings, this brings something to my perspective about my life and where I am? Yes, absolutely. Um, it forced me to take more seriously things that I took for granted, and in particular, the American ability to have hyphenated identities, to have mm. multiple identities. You, where, uh, in France, um, the default mentality, and, and Ethan can give us the history for this, is um, there's one community, the French community. And we have a very different approach in America. And quite frankly, I think it's a better approach. Um, and that approach is you can be American and. You can be American, you can be a Jewish American, a Catholic American, an Asian American, an African American, and, and many multiple. A Muslim American. Muslim American, and, 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 and multiple combinations where you're using three or four hyphens. And, and, and it's, it doesn't make you any less American. And in France, there's a sense that that might make you less French. Uh, and, and so the question that I bring back is, okay, so we have a better approach, but we need to go deeper with it. We need to actually increase the, the exposure to difference, the respect of difference, and we need to say more about why it's a strength that makes America uh, stand out among nations. You know, this, gets, this rings against the Prime Minister's comment. France wouldn't be France without the Jews, but there's a little twist here that Shep is bringing, that in France it is that French identity mm -hmm. is the singular identity. So, how do you how, see how, this? how do these things work together? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, for the French, it doesn't ring against the Prime Minister's comment uh, in the conventional conception. That is, for France, they has, uh, France has long seen itself as a society that could integrate everyone, that could assimilate everyone. So, the ability to give Jews citizenship and integrate them is part of what made the French feel. What does assimilation mean in that situation? Right. Does it mean you become French, or is there a recognition that in that process, whether it's Jews or Muslims or whatever, you are also changing France? Right. Because so I think in America, we, th we imagine immigrants as changing us in a positive sort right. of way. Well, f historians have been debating this question a lot, actually, in the last uh, 10 or 20 years. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, France is unquestionably a more visibly multi-ethnic and multi-religious society than it was, say, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. has to do with the Muslim immigration, has to do also with Jews being much more visible. Uh, the Yper Kashyap supermarket never would have existed in France 50 years ago because it, it would have been seen as too ostentatious of a sign of religious identity. So I, I, I'm, Shep is right about the default assumption, but there's a lot of struggling that's been going on in France, uh, and I think that struggle is very much ongoing. You have big debates right now about what the French call laïcité, which is public secularism, and whether it can be rethought in some way, or does it mean that 
you know, in, in schools, for instance, uh, there's a debate about should Muslim students feel more, quote, accommodated, or should they feel that this is the way it is, this is symbolized the law in France. Symbolized by the question of the headscarf. You know, uh, symbolized by the question of the headscarf, but also, for instance, you had a, a bunch of Muslim students, I don't want to overstate it, I don't know the percentage, I think it was a minority, who refused to stand for the moment of silence in honor of the victims of Charlie Hebdo, right? So then you had a, this reignited this debate about secularism in schools and how should it be imposed, how accommodation it should it be. The French do have this default assumption and they continue to struggle with being a more multicultural society than in some ways they want to admit. But I think it's, is a, it's a very active struggle. Yeah, I do think that there is an interesting thing. I'm an American historian and not a French historian at all. But there's something about America. We are fundamentally this, we are not, the, you know, this concept of nation state mm -hmm. where every language group and culture has its own state right. which functions one way in Europe mm -hmm. and the rest of the world is very different in the United States where yes. where we are an immigrant community That's we right. are a multi everything right. community right. by very at our right. very core right. and that exactly. makes us exceptional it yeah. does and yeah. pluralism as you said is at our core yeah. and it's not at the core in France or in Europe or in most countries of the world yeah. and i think this really showed me that what do you come back with, com maybe even more committed to than maybe w when you left, about what you should be doing here in America, in Cincinnati? It's a great question. I, I think we need to do more um, dialogue and exposure and more opportunities to uh, really get at uh, perceptions, misperceptions, discrimination, exclusions, subtexts about what we think about each other and uh, how we see each other. Uh, we need to do that more actively and openly. There's a way that we can just sort of uh, coast and say, you know, we're better off than they are. Uh, we're only uh, better off until uh, the next thing that shows us that there was many hidden problems that we weren't addressing. You know, Ethan, one of the things that this is about what you were talking about before. Mm -hmm. Part of the culture of modern day France and Europe in general is it's sort of post-religious. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the tr traditional established Catholic Church is long gone. Mm -hmm. And even culturally, it, it functions very differently than it does in America. Right. Um, would the Muslim immigrants, the Jewish immigrants mm -hmm. from Northern Africa who have come, would they be more consciously religious than the French population in general? Mm -hmm. And it's not so much the specific religious expression, but just the fact that they're religious. Well, that's a great question. I, I think the, the truth is that secularism, as it's been conceptualized in the West broadly, has been built based very much on Protestant conceptions of religion. That is, that you can maintain your religion behind closed doors, that you can maintain your religion in private because it's something that doesn't need to be in public. Mm -hmm. So it is partly not just about any religious expression because both Judaism and Islam in their most tr traditional versions are religions where what you wear and the basic laws you follow on a daily basis are central. So it's a different conception of how religion mm -hmm. shapes your daily life and your daily existence and your place in the public sphere. Uh, it's not necessarily compatible with democracy, but it is less compatible with an idea that out there you look and act just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the French conception has been, you know, you can be religious behind closed doors. You can be religious in your synagogue. You can be religious in your mosque. But when you decide you want to start bringing these things into the public square, then we've got a problem and we feel like you're infringing on our version of separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. um, would walking down the street with your yarmulke on be something that would be noted and seen as taking it into the public? Well, the last time that I spent a bunch of time in France was about six weeks in the city of Nantes uh, about two and a half years ago. Uh, I wore my kippah there actually a fair amount. I uh, never had any trouble, never had anybody give me a hard time. Um, I think there are places where, because of the issues that bring us here, uh, it may be, it is less safe, right? So in Paris, where you have much more inter-ethnic tension, I am more reluctant to wear it. But that's a hmm. question about inter-ethnic tension. Um, but no, 
it, it means something else. I think that's what we should recognize, right? I wore a keep on America for years and didn't wear it when I went to France because I said, well, to people, this says something else about what I'm bringing to the public sphere. I'm a scholar. People will think of me as being less objective. So it, it says something else. Then it, it's harder to say it's blended, as Shep said, uh, there. Cultural nuances yeah. really do mean something. Right. So um, you raised earlier, I'm not sure which person said it, but the future of the Jewish diaspora. Well, <laughs> how serious is that question? I mean... It's a very, very serious question. I mean, that was the other thing that shocked me when I was there. People who have lived in France, some of them for 50 years, some of their families for a thousand years, uh, wonder if it will continue to be a hospitable place. And uh, the, the reason that we haven't talked about is this um, toxic brew of um, anger uh, coming from unintegrated immigrant communities with um, a lot of hate speech going on actually on the internet, which blends with um, anti-Israel propaganda that goes far beyond disagreements on policy levels and delegitimizes not only the state of Israel but anyone who they imagine is a supporter of the state of Israel and has actually, you know, Ethan will tell us uh, only in recent years started to legitimize attacks on French Jewish civilians because they might be supporters of, of the state of Israel. And that's um, something that we're completely unfamiliar with here and is really kind of a very cautionary tale, I think. Well, this is a rich topic that we could spend a lot of time on, unfortunately, I'm out of time. Thank you for going to France and representing Cincinnati in our local community here. And yes, the Cincinnati Jewish community, but hopefully the Cincinnati community. Absolutely. And thank you for your scholarship. I look forward to having you both back on the show. Any historian is going to come back. <laughs> Stay thank tuned. You. If you like film, there's a great treat coming to Cincinnati. The Real Abilities Film Festival features films, documentaries, shorts, all sorts of formats held together by great storytelling and powerful emotion. Watch this. All right, so who is she? Who? This friend you've been spending all this time with. Hi. Is that for me? Yes, it is. Thanks. I'm a god member from the flowers department. I'll tell you something. You spent a second with this kid? and you realize he's just like you and me. You feel sorry for him? No, I feel sorry for you. When I was hospitalized, I was told by psychiatrists and by doctors, don't expect to do anything special with your life. You're not going to really amount to anything, so you're going to have to live a very simple, quiet existence. Welcome back. That was a clip from the opening of a documentary entitled Bipolarized, told in the first person by a young man trying to understand and cope with the onset of being bipolar. Combined with a clip from where hope grows just before the break, you begin to get a sense of the range of art that will be available during the Real Abilities uh, Film Festival what uh, has become the largest film festival in the region uh, is organized by LAD, Living Arrangements for the Developmentally Disabled. The festival opens on February 27th and runs eight days through March the 7th. I am uh, joined over those eight days. There will be 30 films that will be screened across the region, and I'm, region, and I'm joined now by Kathleen Kale, the co-chair of the Real Abilities Film Festival, and John Lawson, an actor, spokesperson, and board member of Real Abilities Film Festival. Welcome to Newsmakers. Oh, thank, thank you. you. This thank is, you. Uh, the range of film products that are available is pretty amazing. I mean, it's, um, it's just, and every one of them, well, uh, I didn't watch every one, but right. I was watching just the trailers, but pretty powerful stuff. They it, are. Between the two of us, we probably have watched all of them, and they're incredibly powerful. The stories they tell really resonate with all of us, either because we have a personal connection to disability or we know somebody. There are roughly, you know, roughly 20 percent of the population has a disability. Um, so when you think about it, anybody is, uh, is going to be able to relate to this. As a friend of mine says, we're all just temporarily abled. 
Exactly. You know, so that's true. It's a club that anybody can join at any time. <laughs> at any time, and not and, know. Yeah, yeah it goes across all racial and social, economic uh, classes. Mm -hmm. So. That's one good thing about the Cincinnati Real Abilities Film Festival is that there were over 500 films that were screened and juried, and we brought 17 to Cincinnati, and each one is hosted by and, and uh, it will benefit a local nonprofit here in Cincinnati. So even though we searched around the world globally for all the films, if you buy a ticket, your money stays and supports uh, um, Nonprofits here that you know benefit and enhance the lives of people with disabilities right here in the area. And I'm going to let people know how to find those tickets because there's certainly a range of possibilities of <laughs> going to see one film, going to get a pass for all the films, right. going to the opening kickoff, going to the gala. There's all sorts of possibilities. There's here. all sorts of possibilities. Some of them uh, are free which is really important for people to know. Um, you still need to register, but they're free. For instance, we have an event called um, Livable Cincinnati, which is going to be held at the Great American Ballpark, and, and it addresses how accessible Cincinnati is and how much more accessible we can make it. That's free to the public. Anyone can sign up and come. We have Dave Parker coming from uh, the Big Red Machine and legendary quarterback uh, Ken Anderson, Anderson is going to be there, as well as Hamilton County Commissioner Todd Park. Todd Portoon. But in addition, we have, for instance, um, on Friday morning before our kickoff weekend begins, we have a, a Cincinnati welcome to all the celebrities who are coming into town. A lot of celebrities. A lot of celebrities. We have Marley Matlin coming into town, Danny Woodburn, John Lawson, um, <laughs> Kurt Yeager, Daryl Chill Mitchell. We have newly elected state Michigan State Supreme Court Justice Richard Bernstein. Who was on this show last year to talk exactly, about real abilities. Exactly. Justin LeBlanc from Project Runway. And now a Supreme Court Justice. That's, yeah, exactly. that's amazing Supreme, when I found that the out. The first blind Supreme Court Justice in our country. Wow. So look for him to be on the federal court one day, I imagine. But, but in any event, we're going to have this huge kickoff at 930 at the Hyatt. Anyone from the city is welcome to come down and welcome and this our This is on PIPs. the 27th. This is on the 27th at 930 in the morning at the Hyatt. John, as you look at these films, are, do you have a favorite? Do you have one or two? <laughs> oh, I know, that's a dangerous <laughs> yeah, question. Yeah, that's a dangerous question. I think my favorite is a lot of these films are inspirational and of, of people with disabilities overcoming things and trying to inspire others. But one of my favorite is Where Hope Grows. And ah. the, you showed the trailer just a little earlier. And it is so nice that it is, uh, it's a narrative based off of a, you know, a, a telling a story about a, a father who was a baseball player. It was filmed in Louisville uh, at one of the uh, AAA teams or whatever of Cincinnati Reds. So we're bringing it here sponsored by Cincinnati Reds. We're going to show it at the Great American Ballpark. And you can come out and have dinner and a movie. Meet the star. David's going to be there. And... Um, It'll be, a, it'll be a great night just to see a uh, film about baseball and how this young man with Down syndrome changed this uh, baseball player's life. So it's a really great film. So that's one of my favorites. Okay, that's one of your favorites. Do you have a favorite? Oh, I put, can't say that I do. I'm in charge of a, several of these films, so it would be really unfair for me to say, but I can't tell you how moved I am by the films. And I would just ask people, come out to our premiere, um, our kickoff weekend. We have a luncheon where all these uh, celebrities are going to be. We have a gala event. You can get all of your film tickets and luncheon and gala um, uh, tickets on our website. We have 17 films. All of them are outstanding. And as you said in the beginning, they, they are art. You mentioned art to kick this off. We are leading with art. These are, many of them are um, award-winning films. These are not films that you sit there and say, oh, yeah, good story, terrible film. These are phenomenal films from all around the world. Yeah, and a lot of different languages. I mean, mm -hmm. it wasn't, it's not just right. American films or English language films. These are studies from, there was one, uh, I saw the trailer for a young man who travels across yes, Europe. Yes, Little World. That, right. that looked fascinating. Yes, it's me. about a young man who's in a wheelchair, and he's committed to be able to travel. He's not going to let that stop him. Yep. And um, it's, it's in subtitles, so yes. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. John, are you on the national board or on the local board? I'm on the national That's board. That's what I thought. Cincinnati Real, Abil or Real Ability started in 2007 in uh, New York, and then Cincinnati was actually the first city outside of New York to host the festival. And now last year in 2014, yeah. the national headquarters has been brought to Cincinnati where it is managed by LAD. Boy, that says, that says a lot about our community. It really yeah. does. Um, 
there, because there's so much going on over the eight days of the Real Abilities Film Festival, the best way to get the overview is by going to the website, Cincy, C I N C Y R A dot O R G. You can see single shows, you can get passes for all the shows, you can go to the special events, you can do a whole thing. But you got to go to the website and you really want to see some of these films. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, we leave you with a powerful clip from Travis, a soldier's story. If I give up, I'm giving up on my family. Every day is a challenge, but it's not a challenge.